Let's go ahead and let's look at a couple of examples um, in which the rules for creating Lewis structures um, are slightly altered uh, because of the features of the atoms involved. So if we go ahead and we look at um, the molecule BF3, um, we're going to put this molecule together in the exact same way that we have with all of the others we've looked at so far. As we've done in the past, we add up our total number of valence electrons, um, which is a total of 24 electrons. Put the least electronegative element in the middle when we're creating our structure, following rule number three. Put all the other elements around the outside, okay, so the remaining atoms. We bond each exterior atom to the central atom, okay, so we've used a total of two, four, six um, electrons. Okay, so we're going to subtract out that 6 from our total valence, um, leaving us with 18. We then take these 18, and we distribute them to the exterior atom. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, and we subtract out these 18 electrons that we use, and we have 0 electrons left over. So then our next step is to check the remaining electrons so that each surrounding atom has its octet. Um, and if we go ahead and look at it, we notice that each of these fluorines, they're all bonded uh, the exact same way to the boron. Okay, so we have two, four, six, eight electrons. So each one of the fluorines have their octet. If we look at boron, it has two, four, six electrons. Okay, so we notice that there is not an octet um, of electrons around boron. So normally what that would cause us to do is to um, subtract out some electrons or remove some electrons and double bond our uh, fluorine to our boron. Now, um, what we need to know or what we need to remember um, is that in step number three up here, um, both beryllium and boron are actually exceptions to the rules. So this double bonding is going to be um, an inappropriate activity. And what we're going to use is we're going we're gonna to utilize our formal charge calculations um, to help us see why this is an inappropriate type of bonding. Okay, so we're going to proceed through um, this structure as normal, and then we will chat about it. So let's go ahead and let's calculate our formal charges. Um, remember that in this situation, we have two equivalently bonded um, fluorines. Um, and obviously, this fluorine over here is bonded uniquely. So um, the calculations for the fluorines, we're going to have two separate ones, um, one for this set and one for this set. OK, and obviously, we're going to have a calculation for our boron. So let's go ahead and let's start out with the fluorine with the single bond. Okay, I'm just going to put a little line like that. Okay, fluorine has seven valence electrons. Um, we're going to then subtract out the number of unshared electrons. Each one of these fluorines has two, four, six. So, but since we're looking at individual fluorines, um, it's not 12, it's only two, four, six, because we're just looking at that specific fluorine. Excuse me. Um, so the six goes here and then half of the bonding electrons. So we know that our bonding electrons are here. There's a single bond. So we're going to have half of two because each bond has two electrons. Okay, so seven minus six plus half of two, that's going to give us zero. So the formal charge on each of these fluorines is zero. Okay, so so far we're off to a good start. You know, zero um, values for our formal charges are, are good. As close to zero as possible is what we want. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's do the same calculation for the fluorine with the double bond. Okay. All right, once again, seven valence electrons. In this case, remember we borrowed um, two electrons here. That's our erasing. Okay, and we put them here. All right, so the reality of it is we have two, four um, unshared uh, valence electrons. So we have four here. Okay, and um, remember we created a bond. So we have two, four um, bonding electrons or bonded electrons. So we're going to take half of that four. All right, okay. So what this ends up um, giving us is positive 1, because 7 minus 4 plus half of 2 is going to be a positive 1. So the formal charge on this fluorine is positive 1. So I'm going to put that into brackets. Okay, so 
Um, now our charges are a little bit weird, um, and we'll talk about why, but um, let's do our final calculation. Let's just do boron real quick. Okay, um, boron has three valence electrons. Okay, um, it has no unbonded electrons, and it has eight um, bonding electrons, as we have it drawn here. So in this case, 3 minus half of 8 is going to give us minus 1. So our formal charge on boron is minus 1. Okay, now, our next step would normally be to add up all of our formal charges and make sure that they make sense with respect to the structure that we have. Um, so 0 plus 0 plus negative 1 plus positive 1, that gives us an overall charge of 0, which makes sense. However, we need to think about um, electronegativity and the properties um, and desires of the individual atoms within the structure um, to kind of ascertain if this is the correct structure or not. So how are we going to do that? So if we look at, say, fluorine in this case, um, fluorine is going to be um, the most electronegative element, meaning that it wants to pull electron density towards it. Electron density is negatively charged. So if electron density is being pulled towards something, are we going to end up with a partial positive charge in that structure? Okay, the answer to that is obviously no. Okay, so um, in the same way, uh, boron, okay, it's it, it's definitely not as electronegative as fluorine. Okay, we know that. Um, so it's not going to pull electron density towards itself, so it's not going to have a partial negative charge. So the reality of it is, is that boron's unique characteristics um, end up making it where um, the desire to uh, singly, or excuse me, double bond um, to exterior structures in order to gain its quote-unquote octet um, is not necessary. And this type of concept or this type of approach is true with both beryllium and boron. They are both ex um, happy with a um, insufficient or less than eight octet. So um, the reality of it is, is the structure that we would actually be looking for will be um, a BF3 molecule with single bonds. So we can just look at this real quick, right? The structure would look just like this. Okay, so very simply. Okay, very simply this. If we calculated our formal charges, remember we've already done them for structures, or excuse me, that for the fluorines that are bonded in this manner. Okay, so we're just going to put zeros as our formal charges out here for fluorine, okay? And our boron molecule, or excuse me, our boron atom, okay? <clears throat> In this case, three minus zero, because there's no unbonded electrons, plus half of two, four, six. Okay, that's gonna give us a formal charge of zero. Okay, so remember our formal charges, we want them closest uh, to zero. In this case, this structure right here is the most acceptable. Um, and these are just two of the, uh, two of the exceptions that you must uh, remember. Okay, so um, although this is the direction you want to go, remember you, the formal charges also have to make sense, not just overall for the molecule's um, overall charge, but also with respect to, you know, where the electron density um, would like to lie on the molecule. So, Let's go ahead and let's uh, look at um, another type of exception to the um, octet rule. So let's go ahead and look at the molecule um, PCl5. Okay, um, Just like last time or in other examples, um, we would calculate the number of valence electrons as our first step. Um, our total valence electrons in this case is 40 electrons. Okay. Uh, we follow our second step and put our least electronegative element in the middle. Okay, so phosphorus in this case. We'd surround the central atom with the five um, chlorine atoms. Okay, then we bond each one of those chlorines to the central atom. Okay, and once we've bonded those um, to the central atom, we're subsequently going to count up um, the number of electrons that we used. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay, so we've used 10 valence electrons. We're going to subtract out those 10. Still leaves us with 30 electrons. Those 30 electrons now get, di get distributed to the exterior atoms, just like we've done in the past. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 
one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, uh, six and five is 30. So I've used up my 30 electrons. Okay, and I have no more electrons to distribute. Okay, so um, I need to follow step number five and, and check if every atom has their octet. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's look at the exterior atoms. So all of the chlorines, each one of these chlorines is bonded to this phosphorus in exactly the same way. So um, if I look at this chlorine atom, I have two, four, six, seven, eight. So each one of these chlorine atoms is content. They're happy. Okay, now phosphorus, let's check this out. It has two, four, six, eight, ten valence electrons. Okay, and so normally we would say that phosphorus um, is not following the octet rule, right? Because eight is not, or ten is not eight. Okay, so however, what you need to understand is that if your element, if your central atom is in period three or below, okay, d orbitals are now accessible, okay? And because d orbitals are accessible, that means that these elements can have what's known as an expanded octet. Um, they can mix d orbitals with their s's and p's and subsequently give you um, more bonding capabilities. So they can hold on to more electrons, okay? And because of this, we get structures such as PCL5. Okay, so we would go through this uh, molecule. We would still check our formal charges, which we're going to do here, um, just like we would any other situation. You just need to remember that if your element um, that's in your central atom is in group um, three or below, which phosphorus is, okay, you're definitely going to be able to have an expanded octet. So let's check our formal charges. Formal charges for the chlorines. All the chlorines are bonded the same. Seven electrons minus six unbonded electrons plus half of the single bond that it has. Okay, that gives us a formal charge of zero. Okay, so each one of these has a formal charge of zero. Okay, um, our formal charge for our phosphorus. Um, oops, sorry, phosphorus. <laughs> uh, phosphorus has, what, five valence electrons? Okay. It has no unbonded electrons. It has two, four, six, eight, ten um, pairs that are being shared between it and the five chlorines. Okay, so five minus half of ten is going to give me zero. So your formal charge here is zero. Notice I have a very good structure. All of my values are as close to zero or zero in this case. So um, the formal charge uh, calculation seem like uh, the structure is very good. And if I add up all the zeros, that gives me an overall charge of zero, which corresponds to PCL5. Now, in some cases, guys, you might not actually have more atoms bonding to the central atom. So in this specific case, notice I have five chlorines, so I'm immediately bonding uh, and, and forcing that octet issue to be um, at the forefront. However, there may be times where you have only four atoms or three atoms, okay, and, and multiple bonds might be what facilitates the expanded octet. Um, and basically the way that's going to work is you need to be checking your formal charges. Um, you need to check if, if you have a central atom that's in group three or below, you can double in, and are capable of maybe double bonding. Um, you want to do that double bonding and, and then check your formal charges. Remember, the closer to zero your formal charges on the atoms overall, the better off that structure. So if you have a, a central atom that's in group three or below, um, you may have to draw a couple different structures, you know, maybe double bond here or there to make sure you, that you get the optimal Lewis structure.